Well, hello, church family. Thanks so much for joining us this morning, afternoon, evening, or whenever it is that you're watching this message. I'm Tommy, and I'm the pastor here at Christ Community Church. Let's begin our time together by declaring the redemption that we have that's found in Jesus Christ. We are redeemed. He sets us free. Thank you. 
Bye. 
Well, today our reading comes from the book of Hosea, chapter 6, verses 4 through 6. Would you please read it with me? What shall I do with you, O Ephraim? What shall I do with you, O Judah? Your love is like a morning cloud, like the dew that goes early away. Therefore I have hewn them by the prophets. I have slain them by the words of my mouth, and my judgment goes forth as the light. For I desire steadfast love and not sacrifice, the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. Would you please pray with me? Father God, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for your goodness to us. We thank you for um, the opportunity that we have to um, come together virtually online to study your word and to worship your name. And Father, what's heavy in my heart tonight is the situation in Minneapolis. And Lord, I just want to um, ask for your sovereign hand um, to be over the state of Minnesota, to be over the city of Minneapolis, to be over the Twin Cities area, Father. And Lord, we know that um, that this is a reaction to um, a grave injustice. Lord, we just lift up the situation surrounding the murder of George Floyd. And Lord, we ask that your hand would be upon our art um, our state of Minnesota, my, my home state of Minnesota, and I know this, the home state of uh, many in our congregation, um, Lord, that you would um, be um, sovereignly at work. And Lord, that even um, as we work through a pandemic and as uh, you are using even the COVID-19 situation to bring glory to your name, Father, I pray that your name would be glorified in all of this, even if in the moment it's so difficult to see. Father, I just ask that um, you would help um, me and others as a, as a white man to um, have a listening ear, to be uh, quick to listen and slow to speak, um, to try and, and understand and, and, and uh, you know, as best as we can, the um, hurt and the bitterness and the, and the anger that has just um, uh, really boiled over in recent days. And, and, and Lord, help us to resonate and to stand with um, our African-American brothers and sisters as we resist injustice and as we seek to um, really glorify you in all things. And so, Lord, I just ask that you would um, be with our nation, be with the state of Minnesota, be with our leaders in all of this. And Father, help us to do whatever small things we can do to um, glorify your name in the midst of these uncertain and difficult times. So Father, it's in your holy name that we pray. Amen. Nev was a young photographer living in New York City. When one day he received a uh, request from an eight-year-old girl named Abby, who uh, lived in Michigan, and she was wondering if she could get his permission to paint one of his photos. And Nev is flattered by this, and so he obviously grants her permission to do so. And uh, through this exchange, they become Facebook friends. And Nev soon discovers that Abby has an older sister named Megan, who's a 19-year-old college student. And Nev finds Megan to be extraordinarily beautiful, and so he reaches out to her on Facebook, and the two soon begin an online relationship. And boy, are they in love. Over the course of nine months, they exchange hundreds of text messages. They send pictures to each other, and they sh share with each other some of the most personal and intimate details about their lives. Megan, who's a talented singer, even uh, records songs for Nev, uh, taking requests from him, from him and, and, and recording songs that he likes. However, it's here that things start to get a little bit fishy. You see, Nev realizes that the songs that Megan is recording from him for him aren't actually her songs. 
but rather they're uh, audio clips from performances that have been uploaded onto YouTube. Because of this, Nev decides to confront Megan about this and actually decides he wants to meet her in person. And so he drives 1,300 miles to Michigan to, uh, to just shows up at her front door. But when he arrives, what he discovers is shocking. Megan is not a 19-year-old college student. She's a middle-aged married woman with kids who is actually named Angela. Who she was online was completely different than who she was in real life. She appeared to be someone she was not. Nev's story is found in the documentary called Catfish. And the term catfish has now become the word that describes this kind of deception online. Maybe you've heard stories like this before, stories of people pretending to be someone they're not and misleading others. But I think we can all agree that each of us, in some way or another, have been a catfish. We all have, at some point, tried to appear to be someone that we are not in order to impress other people. And it's one thing to do that relationally with others, but it's a whole another thing to do that in our spiritual lives. You know, we're continuing to work through the book of Hosea in a series we're calling Redeemed. And the story found in the book of Hosea is one of my favorites in the Bible because it's a clear depiction of God's grace and his kindness towards his people, even when we rebel against him. But at the same time, Hosea's prophecy is a heartbreaking story, as we have to spend quite a bit of time wading through the difficult reality of Israel's perpetual sin and unfaithfulness to God, and the coming judgment that they will, uh, that will wreak havoc on their nation because of it. As I mentioned last week, we're going to be tackling this book maybe in a different way than we're used to. We're not going to look at it verse by verse, but rather we're going to try and look at the major themes in the book. And last week we spent some time looking at Israel's history and how they have been in, in conflict with the will of God almost from the very beginning and how their nation has uh, become characterized by sinful behavior and by Baal worship. And we talked about how the priorities in Israel are completely reversed. And an example of this is the fact that they're offering child sacrifices. They're, they're killing their infants for a cow god, right? It's the, the situation in Israel is absolutely horrible. But today what I want to do is, again, focus on Israel's unfaithfulness, but specifically I want to focus on how they try to catfish God, in that they try to appear to be a people that they're really not. And we see this in three primary ways. We see this in their flagrant hypocrisy, in their reliance on faulty help, and in their false heart. I think we will find the same kind of deception Israel struggled with back then is something we also wrestle with today. So let's start by looking at the first issue, Israel's flagrant hypocrisy. Look at chapter 6, verse 1. Come, let us return to the Lord, for he has torn us that he may heal us. He has struck us down and he will bind us up. After two days he will revive us, and on the third day he will raise us up, that we may live before him. Let us know, let us press on to know the Lord. His going out is sure as the dawn. He will come to us as the showers, as the spring rains that water the earth. What shall I do with you, O Ephraim? What shall I do with you, O Judah? Your love is like a morning cloud, like the dew that goes early away. Therefore I have hewn them by the prophets, I have slain them by the words of my mouth. And my judgment goes forth as the light. For I desire steadfast love and not sacrifice, 
the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. But like Adam, they transgressed the covenant. There they dealt faithlessly with me. This passage begins with a wonderful proclamation that is meant to be from the mouths of the people of Israel. Come, let us return to the Lord, for he has torn us that he may heal us. And in God's going out is as sure as the dawn. He will come to us as the showers, as the spring rains that water the earth. Man, that's beautiful, isn't it? Those are beautiful words. Well, it would appear so. But here's the problem. Israel's desire to return to God isn't authentic. They aren't turning back out of a heart of repentance, but simply because they feel pain and they want God to take that pain away. It's an ancient form of sweet talk. Have you ever sweet talked to someone before or has someone ever sweet talked to you? Meaning you flatter them or they flattered you in a way that was inauthentic because they just wanted to get something from you. That's what Israel is doing here. They feel pain and they want God's favor, but they desire it insincerely. That's why God says their love is like a morning cloud or like the dew that goes away early. In other words, there's, there's no substance to it. It won't last long. Their words are empty. And then in verse 6, God makes this profound statement. He says, For I desire steadfast love and not sacrifice. The knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. Now, what's super interesting to me about this verse is that Jesus actually quotes it in the uh, book of Matthew. And he doesn't just quote it once, but he quotes it twice, both during exchanges that he has with the religious leaders of his time, which were the Pharisees. First, in Matthew chapter 9, we are told that as Jesus was eating at the house of the disciple Matthew, who was a tax collector, at his dinner table, many tax collectors and sinners came and were reclining with Jesus and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? But when he heard it, he said, Those who are well have no need of a physician. But those who are sick, go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. And during the second instance in Matthew chapter 12, Jesus' disciples are casually picking grain in a field on the Sabbath day, which was the Jewish holy day of rest. And so some Pharisees see them doing this, and so they begin to give Jesus a hard time about the disciples working on the Sabbath. Working on the Sabbath was forbidden. But in response to this, Jesus criticizes their strict view of the Sabbath and tells them that if you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. For the Son of Man is the Lord of the Sabbath. Man, I love how Jesus responds both times. He says, go and learn what this means. Or if you had known what this means, you wouldn't be acting this way. But if you're anything like me, you're probably just as confused as the Pharisees are. What does it mean? What does it mean to uh, uh, desire, for God to desire mercy and not sacrifices? Well, let me try and explain it by asking this question. At the end of the day, what does God value more? Your ritualistic actions? Or does he value the status of your heart? Does God want you to pray to him because you feel you should or because you want to? Does God want you to give money or food to the poor because you want to earn Christian points? Or does God want you to do that because it's an overflow of your love for God? I think the answer is clear. God wants your affection not just your actions. I think if we were all honest, we've all been in a place at some point in our life when our Christianity felt more like a ritualistic religion 
rather than a refreshing relationship. We've all experienced a Sunday when we walked through the doors of the church building or now watched a service online, and we did so out of an obligation to God rather than out of our adoration for God. We say we love God, but when it comes down to it, we really aren't devoted to Him. We don't feel that closeness to Him. And when we wear a mask that outwardly shows devotion to God while our personal relationship with Him is non-existent, man, that's the essence of hypocrisy. As one meme I read uh, recently puts it, Some of you are mad about wearing a mask to church but you've been doing it for years. (laughs) Ouch, that one stings. But all this is to say that what is most important is not what you do for God on the outside, but rather how you feel for God on the inside. And so this is what is going on here with the nation of Israel. They are saying one thing, but they're doing another. They're, They're feeling another. They are claiming to be devoted to God, but they are breaking their covenant with him over and over again. They are being flagrantly hypocritical. But that's not all that's going on here. That's not all we see in this section of Hosea. Not only are they flagrantly hypocritical, but they're also relying on faulty help. Look ahead to chapter 7, verse 10. The pride of Israel testifies to his face, yet they do not return to the Lord their God, nor seek him for all this. Ephraim is like a dove, silly and without sense, calling to Egypt, going to Assyria. As they go, I will spread over them my net, and I will bring them down like birds of the heaven. I will discipline them according to the report made to their congregation. Woe to them, for they have strayed from me. Destruction to them, for they have rebelled against me. I would redeem them, but they speak lies against me. Have you ever picked the wrong group of friends to hang out with? It makes you think of the third movie in the Lord of the Rings trilogy, where the hero Frodo Baggins is is near the end of his journey to destroy the Ring of Power. And on his journey, he has been accompanied by his loyal friend Samwise Gamgee and the pathetic creature Gollum, to whom Frodo has felt this strange sense of compassion towards. And there's a scene in the movie when the creature Gollum deceives Frodo, convincing him that Sam is out to get the ring, that Sam wants to take the ring from Frodo. And so Frodo tells Sam to go away and then entrusts himself to Gollum, who will eventually lead him into a dangerous trap. Frodo rejects his true friend and instead embraces a false ally who will ultimately try and kill him. That's the kind of like what's happening here. Instead of relying on God for their protection, Israel seeks after other nations for help. God says they're like a dove, silly and without sense, calling to Egypt, going to Assyria. The image of a dove would have been a familiar one for the people of Israel, as doves were often trapped and eaten. Doves, when baited with food, will go after the food recklessly, with little concern for the potential harm that could await them. So this is what Israel is like. A silly dove who is single-minded in their pursuits. And so they run to Egypt and they run to Assyria for aid and they, and they look to these nations for security rather than going to God. And this is silly for them to do because Assyria and Egypt are their enemies, right? Egypt has been historically an enemy of Israel. They enslaved Israel for hundreds of years. And Assyria is not much better, right? Assyria is going to invade Israel soon, take them over, take them captive. These friends will turn on them. They're not trustworthy. They have turned to these nations for help. But in the end, it's a faulty place to put their hope. As God goes on to say in chapter 8, For they sow the wind, and they shall reap the whirlwind. Israel is swallowed up already there among the nations as a useless vessel. 
For they have gone up to Assyria, a wild donkey wandering alone. Ephraim has hired lovers. Though they hire allies among the nations, I will soon gather them up. And the king and princes shall soon writhe because of the tribute. They sow the wind and they will reap the whirlwind. By foolishly entrusting themselves to false lovers, to false allies, to faulty help, the end result will be catastrophic when those nations betray them. They have put all of their eggs in the wrong basket and so their destruction is coming soon. Perhaps this is a good reminder to us to not put our trust in anything or anyone but God. Ultimately, God is our protector and our provider. But because we can't see him or we we can't always understand what he is doing, it can be difficult to have faith in him that uh, he's going to take care of our needs, that he's going to provide for us in times of trouble. And the temptation is, is that when we face these times of uncertainty is to place our trust and to place our identity in human institutions, such as uh, the approval of our friends or in our employer or in the government, right? But at the end of the day, these things, these institutions will all fail us at some point. The ultimate source of our security is found in Christ. He is our help who will not fail us. So Israel is flagrantly hypocritical and is relying on faulty help. But perhaps worst of all, they have a false heart. Look at chapter 10, verse 1. Israel is a luxuriant vine that yields its fruit. The more his fruit increased, the more altars he built. As his country improved, he improved his pillars. Their heart is false. Now they must bear their guilt. The Lord will break down their altars and destroy their pillars. For now they will say, We have no king, for we do not fear the Lord. And a king, what could he do for us? They utter mere words. With empty oaths they make covenants. So judgment springs up like poisonous weeds in the furrows of the field. The image here is of Israel being a vine that has been planted in fertile soil. This is perhaps a reference to God's provision to them, planting Israel in a land that's flowing with milk and honey. However, the fruit they bear in this fertile soil is bad fruit. They took their fortunate standing and they used it to worship other gods, to build altars and pillars. And the root of the problem is this. They have a false heart. They claim to love God, but deep down inside, their words are empty. They have no intention to fulfill the covenant they have made with him. It's eerily reminiscent of what Isaiah prophesies in Isaiah 29.13. These people come near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They aren't who they say they are. They say they love God, but they really don't. They appear to be devoted, but they really aren't. And that is what is so devastating and heartbreaking to God. All he wants is to have his people's hearts, but their hearts are nowhere near him. Again, this is the sad state that the nation of Israel is in. But what is true to them is back then is true to us now. God wants your heart. I think we often overcomplicate what genuine faith looks like. We make it a list of do's and don'ts when really it goes much deeper than that. Yes, reading your Bible is important. And yes, praying is important. And yes, abstaining from sin is important. And yes, giving financially is important. And telling people about Jesus is important. But all these things are not the core of faith in Christ. They are evidences of this faith, but they aren't the faith itself. True Christian faith is a love for Jesus. It's a love for Jesus. It's believing that he is God, it's believing that he has saved us from our sins, and it's loving him because he first loved us. 
So here's the litmus test to see how your walk with Christ is going. Do you love Jesus? Do you love Jesus? It's not, how often are you reading your Bible? Or it's not, how much did you give the church last week? No, the test is this. Do you love Jesus? Is your heart set on Christ? Because that's what it's all about, right? That's why we have church. That's why we should pray. That's why we should read our Bibles. Because these things are ways in which we can stir up our affections for Jesus. Just like how having a date night, if you're married, is important to keeping the intimacy alive with your spouse, Having intimate time with Jesus is important because it's not about doing so out of ritualistic obligation, but because you want to do it out of religious affection. If you're watching this right now and you're in a place where you don't feel much affection for Jesus right now, you aren't alone. Right? We all go through times in which we are dry, when our love for Jesus isn't as strong as it used to be. But God's desire is that our hearts would be reignited towards Him, that our passion for Christ would burn once again, that the flame wouldn't die out. Because what God wants most from you is not good behavior. What God wants from you most is your heart. Why? Because you have his heart. He loves you. You are loved and you are treasured by God. And so when you stray away from him, when your heart is no longer set on him and you maybe start to pursue other things, God will do anything, anything to get you back, to win back your heart. And that's where we're going in the next couple of weeks. So you're definitely not going to want to miss the rest of our series, Redeemed. Let's close now with a time of prayer. Father, we thank you that you never give up on us. We thank you that you love us passionately. And you desire to have a relationship with us. And that you desire, most of all, not our good behaviors, but you desire our hearts. And so, Father, I pray that right now you would reignite the flame in our heart, the affection in our heart for you. Father, I want to pray for anyone who at one point felt close to you, but now just feels dry in their walk with you. Father, I pray that you would begin drawing them back to you and that we can just admit that, Lord, we don't feel close to you, but that you would begin to work and draw us to you. And Father, I do pray also for anyone who's watching who maybe doesn't know you, that they would uh, experience your love in a powerful way that they would see that you loved them so much that you gave yourself for them, that you gave your son Jesus to die on that cross, to bear the weight of our sin, and to take our place. That you loved the world so much that you gave your son, and that whoever believes in him will not go to hell, will not perish, but have eternal life. And so, Father, I pray that you would work in our hearts today. Lord, we love you. We know that we don't always love you. But Lord, help us to love you more and more each day. Father, it's in your holy name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, this is our last online-only service as we will begin meeting again in person uh, this next Sunday, June 7th. Messages will still be available online after church, so it's totally okay if you're not comfortable yet to keep joining us online. But if you are comfortable, I'd love to see you next Sunday. Now, may the God of peace be with you as you go about your day. God bless. I am redeemed.